Harvard Divinity School. Refuge in the Storm webinar series, part two, Sickness, Aging, and Death, Caring for Life Cycle Crises, November 14th, 2023. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start us off. So hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Monica Sanford, and I am the Assistant Dean for Multireligious Ministry at Harvard Divinity School. Harvard is located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is the traditional land of the Massachusetts people, and we honor them for the ways they have stewarded this land, past, present, and future. So I'm, I'm very delighted to be able to welcome today three wonderful authors, uh, Nathan Jishin Michon, Dorje Kandro, and uh, George Lee, my friend George Lee. I'm not going to try to mangle your first, your your two Chinese names, George. I'm sorry. I'm, that's a please understand that as a courtesy to you. Oh, Thank you. <laughs> because of my own deficiency. So welcome everyone. We're here in the second of our lecture series on Refuge in the Storm: Buddhist Voices in Crisis Care, which is a wonderful book. Nathan, do you have it that you can hold up? I realize I've left my copy at home because I was reading it, and it's wonderful. There we it is, Buddhist Voices in Crisis Care. So part one of that book is a wonderful uh, example of how Buddhists care for people in large and community scale crisis. So think of things like natural disasters. Uh, part two of the book focuses more on life cycle crises. So these are the things we hear about in Buddhism a lot, aging, illness, death, things that happen to pretty much everyone throughout their life. There we go. Sickness, aging, and death, caring for life cycle crises. So that is the topic of today's webinar. And we have two of the wonderful authors from that section with us, along with the editor of the entire volume, Dr. Michon. Uh, I am going to drop the link to the first webinar in the chat. So if you missed that, you can go back and see it. It's on the HGS YouTube channel. Um, this webinar is also being recorded and will be posted to the YouTube channel sometime in the next few weeks. But if you missed the first webinar, please go check it out. It's well worth it. We also had three wonderful authors um, on that panel as well. What I'm going to do now is introduce our first author, Dr. and the editor of the volume, Nathan Michon, and then he's going to introduce the two authors who are with us uh, today. So Dr. Michon, is a uh, JSPS, so that's the Jap Japan Science, what, tell, tell me. The Society for the Promotion of Science. <laughs> I knew science was in there something. The Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science visiting scholar focused on Buddhist chaplaincy at Ryukoku University in Kyoto, Japan. Dr. Jishin, um, Dr. Michon, I should say, is editor of Refuge in the Storm, Buddhist Voices in Crisis Care, and A Thousand Hands, A Guidebook of Caring for Your Buddhist Community, which is also a wonderful book and right over there on my bookshelf and full of little tabs because I use it all the time. And Dr. Michon especially focuses their research on Japanese Buddhist chaplaincy, chaplain training, and contemplative forms of care. They previously helped in disaster relief, and hospice care. Welcome, Dr. Michon. Thank you. And also thanks to our wonderful authors joining us today. <laughs> I'm so happy to have you both here. Um, and so just for a brief introduction before we get going, uh, Dr. George Lee is a psychologist and certified therapist who has provided psychological services to individuals, couples, and families. And he is a lecturer at the Center of Buddhist Studies at the University of Hong Kong. And Dorje Kandro is a Nagpa ordained by H.E. Uh, Garchen Rinpoche and Alopan, a, installed by H.H. Chetsong Rinpoche. She is Professor Emerita of Education and Cultural Studies at Claremont Graduate University and a retired psychotherapist and a community organizer. Both very involved in so many different activities that <laughs> would take us <clears throat> long to introduce as well. So thank you both for all your work you do in the communities and for your presence here with us today. 
Thank you all so much. Well, can, Nathan, I'm going to call you Nathan because those in the audience who might not know, Nathan and I were classmates together many, many years ago at a wonderful little university called University of the West in California. Um, so it's it, it's wonderful, just from a per, on a personal note, it's wonderful to me that you are here, that George is here, and that I'm getting to meet Dorje. That's all just lovely. Um, so Nathan, I'm wondering if you would start us off with a brief reading from your, your second chapter in the book. You have two chapters. You have the introduction, and then you have a chapter entitled Café de Monk, Caneta Ta Tayo, and the Mobile Deep Listening Café. And I'm wondering if you could start us off with a brief reading from that chapter. Just to say this um, reading and this chapter, um, as you mentioned, Café de Monk. <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll just say a little bit, a brief couple words about that before this little reading. But um, Café de Monk, it's a rather funny name, but in Japanese, it was started by this Zen Buddhist priest, Kanata Tayo, just after the um, large 311 um, tsunami and earthquake in Northeast Japan. And... <clears throat> was basically, as the title suggested, a deep listening cafe. Uh, but the name in Japanese, the word monku means to complain. And of course, monk in English is monk. So it was basically a place that you could come and complain about your life or <laughs> um, situation to the volunteer monks on hand. And so um might say a little bit more about that after, but um he was the one who started up this whole endeavor in that situation. And so this is a little passage that he talks about some of the issues of deep listening. People sometimes say a lot without speaking. There is also plenty hiding behind the words they say. As Kanata, as Kanata points out, quote, even when a person says pain, 10 different people probably use that word with 10 different meanings. There's a story behind each of those words. To help truly understand what they are saying and to show them we are present, we have to listen not only with our ears, but with our entire bodies." Unquote. He points out that Japanese has two different characters to write listen, even though they are pronounced the same way. The first simply refers to the common idea of listening through the ears. But the second, quote, means listening with all your heart and mind throughout the body. The sound that enters the ears carries not only information, but emotion, the way of speaking, the intonation, and subtle senses that surround it all. We have to observe those clues carefully to listen, to truly listen. It involves listening with all our senses and our entire bodies. Without this, we can't get to the heart of what they are trying to convey." End quote. That's lovely. Thank you for that, Nathan. Could you share a little bit more about your own experience with Café de Monk and how you became involved and studied it? Sure. Um, so I, I was uh, previously on a Fulbright uh, to research this kind of buildup of Japanese Buddhist chaplaincy, and it mostly although there were traces and aspects of it before um, this large earthquake tsunami event, that that event 
as tragic as it really was, it also spurned a whole lot of good, um, incredible volunteer efforts, um, incredible um, willfulness and help from people around. And it ended up planting a lot of the seeds of the development of more of this formal um, Buddhist chaplaincy programs and other chaplaincy programs that developed in Japan. Um, and so I was up kind of observing and taking note of all of these movements going on, but also as a part of, I guess you could say, participant observation, um, really participating and wanting to um, not just be a person on the side as well. Um, I volunteered for some of these places as well. And uh, Cafe de Monk was one of those. And um, I got to know uh, Kanata, the founder, uh, through the process and my time there as well, and his family and a lot of the regular volunteers there, uh, which was really, really wonderful. Um, and just kind of seeing the type of work that they were doing. And yeah, it's, I, as I mentioned in there, it, and in the subtitle even, it's kind of a mobile listening cafe. So um, there are in present day, a few more permanent establishments around Japan, but for the most part, they are temporary setups. Um, mostly in disaster zones, uh, sometimes in hospices nowadays as well around Japan, uh, where people know this is a Cafe de Monk day and volunteers <laughs> will come and help. Thank you. And, and you were able to do that because not only are you a researcher and a scholar, but you are trained as a chaplain as well. Yeah. So now you've practiced Buddhist chaplaincy spiritual care in both the United States and in Japan. Um, and I'm really captured by um, this description of deep listening. We talk about lis the power of listening so often in caregiving and in chaplaincy especially, but also in other caregiving professions like psychotherapy. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what makes deep listening so essential to providing good care and particularly good spiritual care? Um, good and big question. <laughs> I like the meta questions, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think as Kanata so wonderfully encapsulated, it's... It, in both sense, it's a type of listening that listens to an, the person in front of you, their whole presence in a way. Um, and so there's so much communication, of course, that happens outside of the words. But also, it's in a way listening with your full presence as well, um, not just your ears, but um through your body and your feeling of the situation and so it's that more kind of holistic exchange in a way and because so much communication happens beyond the words i think it's just very essential to try um at least to encapsulate this broader um modes of communication to try to understand the person in front of us in front of us the best as possible um, but also to really convey that we are fully with them um, because that presence is also such an important part of being there with them um, yeah, at least those are some some basics. <laughs> can, I, can I ask you to expand a little bit on that? Like, why why is it efficacious? Does it help people? Why does it help people? How does it help people going through these crises? Sure. Um, 
So I, I mean, especially to when a person is in a crisis situation, um, you're often not even able to verbalize what is happening in those moments. I, you're still just not even having the chance to process what has gone on. And so to try to put that into words is often still just not even possible. Uh, so often these other modes of communication can come out in either the tone of voice or you know maybe just the body shaking or at it or shaking at a particular word um, that sends um, some important signals as well. And so the attention to all those different details, um, maybe even they, you notice that the person in front of you winces or cringes at a certain phrase or um, either that you're saying or they saying, um, and maybe that's an important clue uh, to something that uh, might be really necessary as well to them in those moments. Um, I, I think I mentioned in the first seminar, a lot of people in crisis situations, especially they haven't even thought about their basic needs yet either. So um, sometimes those clues are important and maybe you realize or get a hint that, oh, they they just ran out of their home um, during a disaster and forgot some critical medicine or um, haven't eaten in a long time and haven't totally even comprehended or realized that. And so sometimes also just asking for um, these basic need questions and picking up these clues uh, from their different reactions in ways that might not be fully verbal. Um, all of these can be important. And so again, of course it's listen, we have to listen to the words they're saying, but um, there can be so many little aspects in the background around that, um, that we, this kind of broader attention uh, might alert us to these different important aspects that they might need attention to as well. Thank you for sharing that. So I'm wondering also based on your experience in both Japan and the United States, does deep listening or even spiritual care in general, but do these skills that you use in these two different contexts, do they look different? Is there is there a deep listening that works better in one situation versus another? Does deep listening work well in one place and not, are there other interventions in another place? Like what's the, dis, are there distinctions that you would make and commonalities as well? Yeah, I mean, I think for the most part, it's pretty similar in both, both cultures, but um, you could say there's a little bit more, um, of course, also every person is individual and there are differences between personalities. But if, if we have to generalize a little more, um, I'd say not just in Japan, but especially, for example, that region of more rural uh, Northern Japan, um, people are much less likely to open up in front of a person that they have just met mm -hmm. um, in particular um, to open up about um, some of their deeper feelings or concerns. And so, for example, that's one reason why the cafe mode was a little more effective there because you start with just um, drinks, drink, drinking tea or coffee together, eating some snacks and having more informal get to know you in a small group type of thing. And 
once you have the chance to get to know people a little more and exchange, then that might offer more chance for a person to feel, okay, now maybe I can open up a little more um, to this person in front of me. Um, and if necessary, then we might go off to the side a little to talk um, slightly more private if a person wants to, but it could also be that that group, um, small group environment provides a certain comfort as well. So um, again, can kind of pay attention to these little signals um, and adjust accordingly. Uh, but I, I'd say that's at least one little difference to open up to somebody you've just met with a deeper story of personal suffering. I think people might be a little more hesitant um, in that area. Um, but again, also, it can be very individual too. Yeah, we can't really generalize across cultures too broadly. We run into, yeah. run into <laughs> problems there. Uh, so I'm wondering, just maybe you can tell us a little bit about what kind of knowledge or training or tools Buddhist chaplains look to in order to cultivate this ability to listen so deeply, because it's really not the way we tend to engage in normal conversation, right? We're, right. we're talking, we're just talking to people. We're like watching what's going by the window and we're thinking about what we're going to say next or what we had for dinner. So this kind of deep listening seems like a real skill. So how, how do we get to a place where we can do that on a fairly regular basis in these kind of situations? Yeah. And honestly, it's something that comes up in the training a lot because I think a lot of traditional Buddhist monks and priests going through the uh, Buddhist chaplaincy training. Um, on, on that side of just being a monk in a temple, a Buddhist <laughs> priest in a temple, you're often just talking <laughs> to people. And that's what uh, comes up a lot in the training um, because people have more of a tendency to just answer the questions more than actually just listening and asking counter questions or exploring um, things deeper with people. So um, it can be it can be very counter to some people's uh, natural tendencies and maybe especially for those who've trained a long time in dharma talks and <laughs> public speaking with dharma talks so um to really just instead um let the focus be on the person in front of you um can be a different type of um exercise uh, to practice and it, i think though that of course, uh, these other traditions and traditional chaplaincy offer a lot of tools um, too, but as Buddhists as well, and from the Buddhist tradition, we have a lot of tools as well. And um, really incorporating this right mindfulness into listening and uh, other parts of the Eightfold Path, or right speech, <laughs> we could say right speech, but a lot of the Buddha's sutras on right speech end up talking about right listening in a way as well. Um, and some of, if we really read some of these sutras about right speech, a lot of them also talk about the Buddha being silent. And I think in some ways that's an interesting clue and an interesting thing we can take as far as list the times of listening and um, how much the Buddha emphasizes um, right timing in speech as well, even if it is fully true, even if it is a helpful and well-intentioned comment, if it's not the right time, 
he doesn't say it. <laughs> and the, the sutras emphasize this aspect a number of times. And so I think the, these are also interesting tidbits to take into this idea of sitting back and really listening to the person in front of us as well. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not really a, that new of a concept in Buddhism. It's maybe just been forgotten or overlaid or de-emphasized <laughs> a little bit in our modern, hey, I'm the expert, I need to have the answer training that so many of us receive, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing this. Um, if for those of for those of you who want to go back and watch the first webinar, I asked Nathan similar types of meta questions about compassion and the distinction between the Buddhist term of compassion and the English word and how we actualize Buddhist compassion in the work that we do in all of these contexts. So now we've had a wonderful conversation about deep listening to add to the conversation on compassion. And I'm really looking forward to what our other two guests bring today. So I'm gonna step back. I'm gonna disappear from your screens for a little bit and let Dr. Michon have a conversation with his authors. Um, but please, I'm monitoring the, the chat and the question and answer. This is a webinar, so you can put questions into the Q&A function, which is down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Feel free to do that at any time, and we will, an we will ask the questions towards the end of our conversation today. So. Thank you so much, Monica. And yeah, I... Again, I'm really honored and happy to see, again, our guest authors today. And so we're, we're going to start with George Lee here. And he was the, I gave a brief introduction before, but um, within this volume, he was the author of a chapter called a Buddhist Counseling Approach for Advanced Cancer. And so many wonderful uh, aspects of that packed into a, a relatively short chapter. Um, but um, I wonder if to start us out, George, if, if you can say a little about this um, bigger theme of cancer and about just a little bit about how widespread an issue it is in the world and um, how it can affect those who discover such a diagnosis. Thank you, Nathan. So um, I think cancer is not a new word to all of us. From my understanding of the statistic, it is about 18 to 19 million of new cases in 2022 and 23, which is which is uh, uh, very alarming. And besides that, like I remember one expert pointed out if we, like the number may not mean a lot, but uh, if we just conceptualize, every one in two people, half of us actually either experience cancer or have any close one who have suffered from cancer. So basically, this is something that is very, very real to all of us. And personally, I have a friend uh, who died from cancer a few years ago. He was only 30-something. And at this mm -hmm. moment of uh, our conversation, my mother is actually struggling with leukemia. So it, it is a huge problem. And that's why I, I'm working, like part of my work is to try to get to know what is cancer and how does it affect us uh, psychologically. And for me, from what I've seen from my clients, from my close ones, one of the big reaction that most of us have is, why me? Why do I have cancer? I have been a good person, or I've done this and that. I could never imagine that. And I think cancer as a crisis, what happened is that um, we all live in a world that we have certain kind of understanding or definition of what is safety. When I cross the road to go home tonight, I, I wouldn't think that a car would hit me. Or like when I open my eyes next morning, I will believe that I will be alive, I will be safe. But cancer as a crisis is blatantly collapse our understanding of safety. 
and then almost like we all live in a protective shield that we will be safe, but suddenly get collapsed. And in that situation, it's very scary. It is a sign to remind us that we all can die. And and because of what happened in the past when we grew up, we always have that strong fear of death, of aging, of sickness. So it will provoke a lot of pain, like you said, different person have our own definition of pain, but it kind of elicited our own concept of pain, our fear embedded with uncertainty, loss, and sometimes a very strong sense of loneliness. So it is a it is a very uncomfortable feeling. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> For sure. Um and as a response, as at least a possible response to this, or uh, working with people um, going through these issues, uh, you bring up the model of note, no choose. And so can you say a little bit about the inspiration behind this model and what these steps are? Yes, sure. And as you have introduced, I started my training as a clinical psychologist. And initially, I was trained in CBT. In CBT, everything is very logical, structure, simple words, and clear graph, and something like that. That reminds me of um, when we are working with people in crisis or any kind of strong emotional reactivity. If I'm going to train counselors or psychologists to do that, Sometimes we cannot remember a lot of big concepts. So I was thinking about maybe I can develop some acronym or some simple words. And then I got into Buddhism, which we all know the three pillars of the practice, the concentration, the discipline, and wisdom, which let me think about like the, num the magical number of three and the no, no choose are three action terms and the verb that it reminds me of in any moment of volition, maybe there are certain things that we can do in a session with someone sitting across to us so that we can um, have them ways to share our insight. So coming back to the model, no, no, choose. That note is actually meaning noticing, gaining awareness. Just like what you said, when people are in crisis, they are in a very disturbed, scattered mind state that is very chaotic. And noting... Uh, at least there are two meanings. The first one is that can we ground, resent, or recall at the mind through a single point in this practice, taking a breath or focusing on things around them, focusing on the body, just like the first frame of mindfulness of the Padana Sutta, focus on our bodily sensation during the chaotic mode. When we are able to consolidate our mind in one object of meditation, then Usually, we are calmer, and usually, it helps us detach from all the conceptual proliferations by taking a break from that and come back at least for a moment for the reality. And when we are in the present moment, usually, there's a moment of stillness and calmness. So we further sustain our training so that we have a more stable and clear mind to observe itself. So knowing exactly resonate with what you said earlier about listening. Even though knowing means to know and see to generate knowledge, but then we need to listen really deeply, thoroughly to our client to understand why they suffer and help them know why they suffer. To know means that to basically investigate, to understand different courses and conditions that sustain, that give rise to a suffering, which is usually from external to internal like from my environment, from the family, from the immediate crisis, to internally, how we perceive the event, and what is the deepest clinging or attachment that makes me suffer. And it's also from conceptual to experiential. Conceptually, we all know like dependent or arising, paticca, samupada, or impermanence and all that. But then when we experience in our body, it's totally different. So mm -hmm. knowing is a deep process of step by step, can we help our client by listening, by dialogue, by different experiential exercise to help them understand what might be some root cause of suffering? When we gain the knowledge, when we know why we suffer, then choose is to come back to this moment, come back to our daily life, 
when we know maybe there are certain kind of habitual pattern that we thought it would bring us happiness, but actually it bring us more suffering. So that we can take a break to see what a new choice point. So that we can think, we can speak, we can act differently. So that is a new karma, and generate new karma ripening, and slowly, bit by bit, moment by moment, shaping our course of action, sequence of habit to a better direction. And then it go round and round like that in the iterative model. So it's kind of the gist of the no Great, thank you. And to to flesh that out a little more, could you provide a case study or example um, of what this might look like in practice? Yes, and uh, um, one of my clients that I always remember was actually a very, very responsible, bright, great medical professional who has a nice family, who has done very well in his job. But unfortunately, even though he doesn't drink or doesn't do anything unhealthy, he developed a very um, lethal cancer in a very short time. So at that time, uh, it was around the liver, like pancreas area. And because he's a medical professional, so when he discovered that, he kind of knew it cannot really be cured. It brings him a lot of uh, fear, doubt, uh, like shocking his whole world. He has lived, he is like one of the people that live uh, as healthy as possible in his life. And all the things are, uh, he tries best to do really well. And no one would imagine like why something so brutal, some cruel, like happening to someone like that. But it did happen. So for noting, noticing, the first thing I try to help him to do is actually listening to him, listening to the life story, listening to what he was, he said and what was being unsaid. And for me, it's not just noticing things that happening in him, all the emotions, all the bodily sensations, but noticing how it makes me feel, how sad I am, and what are the emotions that actually get brought up by being with him to notice that and to accept that. And to take noticing or noting further, when you have the physical pain, one technique that we use was actually chanting. Sometimes mm -hmm. when we are too disturbed by our body and mind, just mindful breathing may be more difficult for beginner. So for him, I actually gave him uh, those like um, um, Buddhist, like those like pebbles, and then he chants with me, Om Mani Padme Hum which help him consolidate his mind a little bit. And then sometimes when it gets too emotional, we will do some chanting, he calm down, and we can talk about his life again. And after his mind becomes more clear in the no stage, we talk about how has he lived his life. Now, like we are very open, but going to be the end stage of his life, are there any regrets? Are there anything that he feel like he should have done? Are there anything that reflecting that there's something that he cannot let go of. So we review how he grew up, uh, all the things he have done professionally, personally, and we reach a conclusion that by what he said, for what he had when he grew up, he didn't have much. Just like like in Japanese, Chinese would like playing matcha, right? Matcha is a game, it's like gambling, it's kind of like a card game, but like solid card. He said, well, for the margin that I have, it's like when I'm born with, all the things I have is actually no connection. Nothing can make me win. But for all the things that I have done, for all the best I've tried, I actually have done pretty well. Even if I lost, I don't lose too much. Like from beginning to what I have done, it's actually very good already. The only thing he cannot let go of is his wife and two young children. But other than that, he know he cannot control. He can only plan for them in this life stage of life. And then... That conversation, that continual dialogue for our sessions, make him feel that part of that is actually a relief, and part of that is more accepting to the condition now, and still think about in the final stage of like what he can do, and for choosing, he chose something that I don't know when I die can I choose or not, but then he did so well that made me so happy and proud, which is he threw a series of parties in the hospital. He got one of his uh, uh, a precious tea leaf 
and then uh, uh, have been there for a long time and take a few um, 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 sessions of parties with different group of people in his life and drink the tea together, his colleagues, friends, family, and for each one of them uh, mm -hmm. to thank them, to glorify the moment, to talk about the sadness and say goodbye. Mm -hmm. And of course, finally, after all that, he still has to leave, he has to die. But in that process, it makes me feel like he is one of the uh, very rare people that has become very acceptance of dying and try to make the best of each moment and really live in the moment until the very last. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's one of the cases. Yeah, well, thank you for the beautiful story. <laughs> uh, and yeah, very touching and so many important aspects of that too. And I like how you also included in, in your listening, the, the listening to ourselves as well, uh, which is also such an important aspect. Um, thank you for fleshing that out in such a beautiful example. Um, but I also wonder too, besides cancer and issues like this, are there um, for people who'd like to explore this method, uh, no, no choose in more depth, um, can you uh, mention any books or resources out there that might also be helpful for people to learn a little more about this? Well, thank you so much, Nathan, for this opportunity. <laughs> so I recently published a book, The Guide to Buddhist Counseling, and in an intervention session, I talk about this no, no choose model with different techniques and different uh, cases that I've tried to apply the technique to. And uh, to be very honest, I think um, if you're interested in this book, you should also get Monica's book and our book because those are all new wisdom that, I mean, like no matter how much I try in writing there, there's some wisdom that, we have our unique insight too. And to be honest, even though I use this knowledge of this book, I still use like what Monica wrote and what are the author wrote in our book, in our daily practice. So hopefully we'll give some insights. And just a brief note about the no no choose. It's not just for cancer, it's for everything. Even when we are practicing meditation, noting your body, noting what is going on now, your mental state, knowing the causes of that and choosing, say like to notice, to let go, to be compassion is a continual thing that we can all remind ourselves in every moment. There's a new choice point to do something. So hopefully this is a, one way to incorporate Buddhist wisdom in an easy term to remind all of us on cultivation. Thank you. And I, are there other situations or cases in which you've found this model really useful to apply? Yes, um, there was uh, another case that um, I was working with, and that is a young girl who have a lot of suicidal urges and thoughts, and especially when anything about relationship, she gets triggered when she has an emotional reactivity. She tends to self-mutilate, or one time uh, she took like a tylenol to try to like hurt herself, not to the point of like committedly killing herself, but at least hurting herself to cope with the urges. So noting, um, similar to what happened, always starting with listening, always starting with using our all five aggregate to feel, to observe, to listen, and to understand and check with we understand. And then I realize is that every time when she have any thoughts of being abandoned, of uh, any time of being um uh, uh lost of her source of security such as the boyfriend is not available dumping her or rejecting her any kind of like separation or rejection like that she get really really upset and would trigger a lot of emotional hilarity so uh chanting uh grounding or one thing that i do is called happiness grounding which is help her look at the surrounding and describe anything that she find beauty in and focus there mm -hmm. Use the eyes, use the smell, use the touch to focus on sensations in the present moment. And uh, some of the skills were able to help her calm down a little bit. When she calm down, the knowing phase is to go back deeper into our clinging to the self-notion. 
clinging on to like how she wants to be like because she grew up from a family of very chaotic situation uh psychotic siblings who will be violent father was absent mother being critical and the best uh of uh support in the family is a sister who actually suffered from physical disability in all the situation he could not build up a sense of self that is safe that is secure and self-sustaining since she was very young she needed to rely on other people especially the relationship to feel safe and a lot of times she projected her inner desire of safety as fantasies on the romance and then every time where she have a relationship she would jump right in and then try very hard to find a man to help her get out of her own family but all the time it actually resulted in disappointment and every time when she get hurt she just become more and more emotional and try to grasp even more so reflecting on those kind of childhood their experiences in the past relationships helping her see the pattern help her know that ah this is how i created this self notion that i have to rely on other people and fantasies to live so mm-hmm. that we, i try to help her see out of like this is actually what monica taught me regardless of all the suffering that you have regardless of all the courses and conditions that make you suffer now even if you do cannot change it what would it take to still find some happiness and she find her joy in a new job in connecting with people in teaching in training a new generation so besides focusing on all the conceptual proliferations that she thought would bring her happiness she really generally start to get in touch with her inner part that actually bring her joy which is the connection of people and appreciating how she can actually feel good devoting her energy and time to flourish the next generation and then she chooses to do more of the things that make her happy instead of just rely on other people so this is how the no no choice model go and then every time when she make a choice i teach her to note again to notice again and know whether satisfying or not and choosing to do again and again so slowly she makes some changes and doesn't need to come back to see me <laughs> which is happy which is good because like i i love to see people but people who come to see me i wish that they would never come back <laughs> <laughs> because they would be happy <laughs> because that means things are going much better right <laughs> yes 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 yeah thank you um and just maybe uh before we close out our um conversation together uh just for a little bit more about um your own role at hong kong university and uh, you help with a Buddhist counseling and Buddhist chaplaincy programs there, as I understand. Uh, do you also apply this and these methods to your training with students over there? Yes, yes. Um, so I'm uh, one of the key founders of the Master of Buddhist Counseling Program at the Center of Buddhist Studies in the University of Hong Kong. We try to be one of the earliest pioneer to promote to introduce an approach to integrate uh, psychotherapeutic techniques and Buddhist wisdom into a way of contemporary counseling based on Buddhist teachings. And this is our six years of running the program and things are going pretty well. So in the program, at least for the classes that I teach, I really emphasize on a no no choose model in first the noting. Can we can we can we actually all when we think that we are going to help people can we actually secure a good foundation of spiritual advancement mind cultivation for ourselves so that when we say that oh we preach dharma but we should be the first one to benefit from dharma i keep telling students that if you are going to sell insurance if you don't buy it yourself it wouldn't be meaningful <laughs> so that it's kind of like we if you want your client to be happy happy counselor happy client so that what we do is like happy teacher happy student we all have our own cultivation and in the program we have many ways to help students find a way to learn like yoga traditional buddhist meditation to help them develop a committed practice plan so that they can continually cultivate themselves so that when they are being with their client they're more effective and being with their own life 
they are actually happier. And knowing is the most difficult part in the program. People come to the program, they keep thinking that I'm learning all the cool intervention and technique to help people, but they didn't know that our first, the first client and final client that we have is always ourselves. So in the program, there are a lot of different kind of reflections and contemplations on our past. How do we construct our sense of self and how do we cling on to them and what is a better way to live our present moment, something like that. So in the program, many students actually need to get through a lot of challenges in their life. And finally, they become happier at the end. But in the middle of processing that, practicing Dharma can be very, very difficult and, and brings more suffering at the moment. But after that, mm -hmm. they're okay. And choosing is a lot about interventions. In the programs, based on our research, based on our clinical experiences, we have developed a variety of techniques to teach the students. So that through role plays, through different kind of uh, uh, class exercises, they all get to learn different ways to practice different kind of Buddhist counseling technique. And then they need to be the first one to find helpful in order to help other people. So basically, this is the gist of the program. And in essence, is is all about training ourselves to be more skillful to live our life so that when we see our clients who will be more sensitive more compassionate to being with them so that's the gist of the program right thank you so much for sharing both on your chapter and your work and your wisdom and um yeah <laughs> thank you thank you and so now we're going to shift over to Dorje Kandro. And uh, Dorje is the author of a wonderful chapter in this book entitled In the Charnel Ground of a Dying Latinx Man, Practicing with Emilio El Nino Fidencio and La Santa Muerte. And um, I, she tells a beautiful story throughout this chapter. Um, so I definitely recommend for those who've um, got the book and not yet read it or <laughs> um, it, to those who might be thinking about it also, um, just to note briefly, um, like, was it Lion's Roar or Tricycle? <laughs> um, Tricycle. Tricycle is going to publish a, a, a somewhat abbreviated version of this chapter as well um, in an upcoming issue. So um, it's a, a beautiful story. Check it out. <laughs> Um, and one of the big themes coming through this chapter also is dual religious belonging. And I was wondering, could you speak a little to this and um, the role in care and such? Well, let me back up a little bit and uh, relate it a little bit also to the story that appears in the book you edited. Um, first of all, most of my work has been with migrants uh, in the US-Mexico border. Initially with Mexicans, increasingly with uh, Central Americans, and now with people from all over the world. And we're talking about thousands of people coming in every week, every month, and so forth. And where I've met them um, has not been usually in an office or in a hospital, a traditional office or a hospital. I've met them in my car, in the shelters, uh, in tents uh, with unsheltered homeless migrants, uh, in places that were what I would call non-institutional places. The story that I relate in this um, in, in your book that you edited, um, begins with um, my work in Juarez. And uh, I was just doing some work helping people from an NGO um, 
fill out applications for asylum uh, there and have the people that were there at the time, it was a easier time than now, uh, apply for asylum. And uh, well, this was not working very well. Uh, so I went uh, before I came back to the United States uh, to have dinner at a at a place uh, in Juarez. And uh, I met a woman by the name of Mercedes and I want to read from my uh, uh, article. I met Mercedes, a woman who was waiting tables. She told me he, she had tried to cross the border several times without success and was going to try again the following week. It was the last evening I was to spend in Mexico before returning to my academic post in California. When I told her this, she asked me if I could mail a small box to her son who resided in San Diego at a Casa de Curación, which the translation is House of Healing. She said that, she was, that he was very sick and she wanted to send him a small image of El Nino Fidencio and some re remedies, home remedies. She was afraid that if she mailed the box in Juarez, it would get stolen. Against my better judgment, I agreed to mail the box on the other side of the border. But I warned Mercedes that if my car was searched upon crossing the border, U.S. custom officials would probably think that the remedios were illegal drugs and I would get into trouble and the box would be confiscated. Nevertheless, Mercedes begged me to take the box and gave me a big hug and a kiss while saying a prayer to protect me from harm. She then assured me repeatedly that El Nino Fidencio would look after me. The following day, I crossed the border with the Estampitas and Remedios box in my backpack and without any trouble. I had planned that once I was in San Diego, I would FedEx the box to Mercedes' son, but when I read the address, I realized that on my way home, I would be passing by the facility where he was living. I decided then to deliver the box in person. The door of the small house where the box was addressed was open. And when I walked in, the three men who were sitting in the living room watching TV at first paid little attention to me. The one side of the TV set was in the altar with pictures that I assume were from family members and also pictures of Catholic saints. In front of the pictures, there were small glasses of water, a bottle of rum, cigars, and freshly cut flowers. One of the men who said his name was Gonzalo welcomed me when I told him that I had come to deliver a box to Emilio. He immediately noticed my interest in the altar and said that he was the cuidador, caretaker, and that the pictures were of his and his wife's ancestors and ancestors of the men that were currently living there. He added, the others are from La Virgen de Guadalupe, the Virgin of Guadalupe, Catholic patron saint of Mexico, and other saints. Then he asked, do you know their names? Yes, I think so. I responded as I tried to remember the pictures from the altars of the Catholic churches that I had frequented as a child in my native country. I proceeded to list the Virgin of Guadalupe, St. Jude, San Cipriano, San Diego, and San Santiago. Then I looked to the small table tucked away in a corner and saw a standalone picture of an amber-colored skeletal figure dressed as a bride holding a scythe and surrounded by candles, dried flowers, dollar bills, bones, and other offerings. Gonzalo smiled and said, I imagined you do not know Nuestra Señora de la Santa Muerte, Our Lady of the Holy Death. Yes, I actually do. I responded, feeling somewhat proud. Gonzalo nodded and smiled at me again. Yes, I said, she is the patrona patron of this home. Shortly thereafter, Mercedes' son Emilio came into the room, um, assisted by a woman whom Gonzalo introduced as his wife and said she was a curandera, traditional healer. So here began 
my journey with La Santa Muerte or the Holy Death. This was many years ago. And at the time um, it was said that La Santa Muerte uh, was the patron mostly of members of drug cartels, particularly the Sinaloa cartel and the Juarez cartel. And I said, oh my God. And um, and very, very controversial to the extent that the uh, that Mexico, uh, the country of Mexico considered it a threat to national security. And the police was always destroying altars that were in public places and so forth, although they kept away from the original altar of La, to La Santa Muerte in Mexico, which was in a very uh, problematic area of the city called Tepito. Uh, anyway, so uh, I began to work uh, with Emilio, and that is the story. And he was um, very ill uh, in the late stages of uh, AIDS. And uh, he was very, very, very uh, committed to the practice of La Santa Muerte. And, uh, and I was not familiar with how you practiced with La Santa Muerte. And uh, he was also very interested in Buddhism. And so we had uh, many, many conversations. We shared a lot. And then one day he asked me, uh, could you please give me a, pra a Buddhist practice uh, that I can do? Because I've heard that Buddhists uh, really try to help everyone without exception, the same way that La Santa Muerte does. Uh, La Santa Muerte does not discriminate. It doesn't matter if we're gay. It doesn't matter if people are addicted. La Santa Muerte is always with us. So for a while, we practiced together um, Tonglen, giving and taking, which is a, a Mahayana practice. And, uh, and then he would uh, visualize at the top of his head, uh, La Santa Muerte, and I, uh, and I would visualize uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama or, or my idam. And so we began doing these uh, practices uh, and it was a kind of uh, spiritual fluidity, more than a dual belongingness or multiple belongingness that I found in that home. Uh, conceptually, I'm a, very familiar with the literature. I love the recent book by uh, Dwayne Bidwell, When One Religion Is Not Enough. But I had never really witnessed the spiritual fluidity in a home with so many people. Uh, some were practicing Catholicism, a uh, pretty traditional Catholic tradition, and La Santa Muerte. Uh, others were uh, very much beholden to El Nino Fidencio, who was a healer in the in 19th century Mexico that a lot of people uh, are very devoted to him and to other healers and so forth. So that was an incredible experience for me. And when, uh, however, when Emilio left back to go to Mexico to die, essentially, um, I stopped going to La Casa de eh, Curación, the healing house. I kept in touch with them by phone. And then when they all went back to Mexico, uh, you know, I kept uh, to, you know, by mail and then eventually by email. So anyway, that was just in the back of my mind. Suddenly out of nowhere, uh, I was doing some volunteer uh, clinical work in uh, a hospital in Tijuana. And uh, every weekend I would go there and suddenly more and more people appeared to be involved in La Santa Muerte and more and more people appeared to be interested when I told them that I didn't know very much about La Santa Muerte, but I was willing to work with them. Um, and I, they would ask me what I practiced and I said, I'm a Buddhist. And, uh, and then they became really interested in Buddhism. And this continues to this day. And it's become more and more um, the case. For example, I just saw in the Reddit platform, somebody asking uh, a couple of days ago, um, I'm a Buddhist, but I'm being called by La Santa Muerte. What do I do? Um, so in my practice, show uh, the, I, the image of... Yeah, you, the if there is in the chat room some images already that John Fries okay. did. But if you want to put the image of the three, uh, Santa Muerte. 
Okay, this is uh, the image of La Santa Muerte. La Santa Muerte is always portrayed, first of all, as a deity. Uh, but it's a deity that has never been a human being. This is not like Fidencio. It's not even like the Buddha. It's not even like Jesus. This La Santa Muerte has always been a deity. And it is the presence of death in our lives. It's always um, a bony lady with a cloak. And um, I guess in English you call this a size or something. S-C-Y-T-H-E. Uh, and then you have a globe. And uh, the symbology of this is that uh, the cloak grants protection or invisibility. And this is very, very important to migrants um, and to everybody, but to migrants in particular. Uh, the globe is to say that she, she has dominion, and it's a she, dominion to uh, of the earth and of our lives. And uh, the scythe is having to do with harvesting of souls, but most important, the body, uh, uh, the bony body is the symbol of impermanence, that we're here and it's very impermanent. So might, might as well do as well as we can um, with the time we have left. So what happened after this, uh, and what still is happening in my life is for whatever reason, coincidence, synchronicity, if you're a Jungian, um, is that I am called by people increasingly uh, or, or meet with people increasingly in situations where they are in difficult uh, problems, whether they're dying, whether they're being evicted, whether they're being afraid uh, because they have an illness and they think it's not going to be cured. And I see them in what I would call non-traditional uh, places or uh, third places. I see them in cars and on the street because as you probably know, we have a tremendous amount of unsheltered homeless people these days and California is a good example of it. Many of them are migrants, many of them are Latinx, they're other people, but so I do a lot of my work in um, in cars. Also, sometimes I go to hotel rooms when were they motel rooms that they have had for a night or two. Uh, sometimes I see them, as I said before, on the streets. Sometimes I see them in shelters on the other side of the border. Uh, sometimes I've seen them in uh, bars and uh, immediately there's this kind of celebration of death in their lives. So we've come up with several approaches to working <laughs> with Buddhism, um, what I called uh, heart practices and La Santa Muerte. I met with about four practitioners of La Santa Muerte, including a, a priestess. And uh, I also read a magnificent book that if you ever want to read something much better than what I'm telling you now about La Santa Muerte is by Thomas Powers. Called La Santa Muerte. And uh, he's a mortician, actually. He's not a scholar, but he attends to a lot of uh, people, um, you know, and, and works as a priest of La Santa Muerte. And so, so I've become kind of uh, an attendant to La Santa Muerte. And uh, I don't pretend to be a practitioner of La Santa Muerte or a priestess of La Santa Muerte. I just say that. For some reason, she has come into my life that I'm a Buddhist. And so together with some of my uh, clients, with the work of Thomas Prowers that I don't know personally, but I've been in communication with him, uh, I've developed with my clients many um, processes of what they would call communion with death, 
which would be related to the uh, Santa Muerte in dressed in black. Uh, colors are very important in this tradition. Um, I I'm very much in uh, you know involved in what they asked me to do purification uh, for different reasons. Um, and uh, it's the Santa Muerte in white. I use a lot of the paramitas uh, from the Buddhist tradition uh, to deal what they call destiny and I call karma. And then the red, um, and there are others in other colors, the red, um, Santa Muerte is to deal with legal problems, wanting to get out of jail and so forth. My clients are migrants, people in jail, people who have just been released from a cult like La Luz del Mundo, um, and other people that I don't like to say or, or I don't like to ask them what they do. So that's what the article is about. Yeah, thank people you. People at the periphery. And um, just to also wrap some of this up, can could you compare um, the difference in a couple minutes of what what working in non institutional settings like that? What's different as compared to meeting in an office, and what? Um, what that difference brings or how it might help uh, you connect with them or deal with that particular, uh, with those people in that particular setting? Well, this is something I would like to bring up because not only was I working and still continue to a certain extent working in these non-institutional spaces by myself and with some other people, but I used to be an academic. And I used to teach teachers and counselors and so forth. And particularly I taught people who did social service work in the communities. These were students who were, you know, training to be counselors or teachers and so forth in the community. And they were serving uh, marginalized communities and so forth. And then occasionally I would get a call, an urgent call in my office and, uh, a student would call me and said, there has been a shooting at the building and somebody is dying or is dead or something like that. And I would say, and? And she would say, we need you here or we need a psychiatrist or something like that here. I said, you can work with the people. You're trained in this. It was like always, this is happening in these marginalized communities. We need an expert here. And... Uh, and the expertise was not only in them, the expertise was in some of the people who were there dealing with the problem. And we didn't need to superimpose a, an expert in it. Sometimes, yes, we could call a counselor, a psychiatrist, whatever, but they did not have a sense of the expertise of people in those communities that to be quite frank, and sometimes was much greater than mine. Uh, mm -hmm. I had things to offer them. They had things to offer me. So I had to teach my students to make sure that they listened not only to the problems of the people that we were assisting, but the resources, the assets in those communities. Mm -hmm. And I said, these people have walked for a month from Panama to here without any resources, and you're telling me that they don't have any resources, please try to work with the resources, try to find, and one of the resources was La Santa Muerte. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. The second thing was that I learned to take my Santa Muerte toolkit, because uh, with La Santa Muerte, you have to pay a lot of attention to uh, candles, for example, light and in the different colors. You have to pay attention to incense, and that's probably a legacy of the Catholic Church. You have to pay a lot of attention to different artifacts that communicate the presence of La Santa Muerte. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's very interesting 
Uh, you know, I never thought I would have to carry a bag with all these things, but it helped me a lot. And then it was, it helped me a lot relating to your cafes, you know, to go and have a drink maybe before and I don't particularly drink, but believe me, I have had tequila more than I want to even think about. Uh, and so I told one of my llamas, I'm breaking my vows every day. And he said, okay, go ahead. I won't, I haven't listened to this. So it's, it's a very different kind of thing. It's you become a friend, part of the family um, and so forth. And, and these are where people at the margins live. And mm -hmm. it's not only dealing with issues of death, it's dealing with issues of, for example, being gay in the middle of a marginalized community. It's different than being gay, you know, with my students in the colleges. Um, so so that's what I do. I, I no longer, well, I'm part living in retirement, but um, in retreat, not in retirement, but in retreat. Um, but uh, I no longer work from an office. Um, I went the other day uh, to see, you see, I mentioned it to you, uh, to see somebody who was dying and he was dying in a shelter. Thank you so much for sharing uh, and the stories and the examples, powerful, important examples. And um, thanks to both of you for um, being with us today and sharing your wisdom. Um, we're going to transition now. I think Monica's back and we might have some questions as well from the audience. Thank you everyone for such wonderful um, presentations and conversation. I've learned so much just listening to you and reading your chapters and reading your other works. Um, so we have a couple of questions and I'm going to encourage anybody else who is uh, watching, go ahead if you have questions and add them to the to the Q&A, to the chat. Uh, but one question that came in, uh, and I think maybe George and Dorje, you're probably more um, qualified to answer this is, uh, what is the difference, if there is one, between Buddhist informed psychotherapy and psychotherapy-informed Buddhist spiritual care. So that's a little bit about the difference between cha how chaplains are trained and what they do and how psychotherapists are trained and what they do and how we kind of cross some of those boundaries while understanding our scopes of practice. But it's the difference between Buddhist-informed psychotherapy and psychotherapy-informed Buddhist spiritual care. Would anyone like to take on that one How about George you go first <laughs> sure sure well um I think just like Nathan talk about same word of pain there will be 10 people 10 different different definitions I would just give my understanding of uh, what might be some differences so a short answer is that I think nowadays it's not too much difference but originally from my understanding of say like psychotherapy and spiritual care psychotherapy originally more about uh symptom focused more like less about religion and spiritual or also tea at least from my training i think uh american psychological association in a very recent time to develop and endorse like religion spirituality and have their own division but more traditional psychotherapy they kind of like don't talk too much about that or when they talk about that they talk about maybe the psychology or how is it a worldview of a client instead of having a spiritual connection. But when you do spiritual care, from my understanding, um, we need to cultivate an interfaith understanding and, and the discussion, maybe spiritual, maybe religious, maybe faith-based, maybe more about meaning. So initially, they are a little different camp, but I think when time progresses, I think it's in a way that spiritual care and psychotherapy, they start to acknowledge the value and essence of each other so that it's like a Venn diagram emerging and there are more and more overlapping areas. So when we come to the, the key question, what is the difference between Buddhist-informed psychotherapy and psychotherapy-informed Buddhist spiritual care? I don't think there can be a lot of differences, especially all of us 
as a spiritual care provider or psychotherapist, we have our own view and perhaps nowadays a more integrated view between spirituality and psychotherapy. So it really depends on the person doing that. And for me, particularly, when I do so-called Buddhist counseling for my model, the default is I try to take early Buddhist teachings as a school of psychology. And when I use that theoretical orientation to talk to my clients, I usually don't mention too much about religions or faith. I just use the wisdom to help them to think about like, say like, how can we use uh, multiple courses and conditions to view the events? How can we accept more, see more life is impermanent? What is your attachment? Those kind of things that we don't need to talk about Buddha, Bodhisattva, those kind of things. So for me, even though it's all informed by Buddhist wisdom, well, like I don't need to use the term Buddhism or have any kind of like more spiritual things, unless, unless it is helpful for a client, then I would do more about spirituality, mm -hmm. religion, we may read sutta together, we may talk about interpretations, we may introduce like four immeasurables or different kind of concepts. Mm -hmm. But I don't know too much about psychotherapy informed Buddhist spiritual care because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trained as a chaplain. So maybe Dorje can, can help me a little bit in that. Thank you. <laughs> that was a very good explanation, George. And I agree with most of what you said. What I would add is that I don't identify myself as a Buddhist psychotherapist or whether informed or not. Um, if I am asked uh, and if people come to me to ask me things about Buddhism, I will, you know, talk about it and talk about my practice if they ask me. Um, what informs me is, um, you know, the paramitas, uh, I don't think I would be the same person that encounters a client or a friend if I were not Buddhist. And uh, if they ask me about what Buddhism has made, uh, has it made a difference in your life, which is usually what they ask me, then I talk about it. Uh, but I don't go in there to think about informed or the difference between the two. Uh, so I think that's that's what I would say. Um, for me, uh, spiritual care is uh, being present. Uh, it is, uh, you know, sharing, like you said, the wisdom of my tradition and other traditions, uh, but without making it necessarily an interfaith kind of discussion or syncretic kind of thing. I, I work with what the person brings to me mm -hmm. and who I am. Yeah, I would like to just add a, a, a something that I've learned from my um, a role model that I have because seeing you guys really reminded me of him. His name <laughs> is uh, Professor Louis Gomez, and maybe many of us still remember him. Um, before uh, uh, before he passed away, I have a privilege to saw his lecture and have a conversation with him. And at that time, I have not developed anything like that. And then I asked him, so, Professor Louis Gomez, you have a PhD in clinical psychology. You have a PhD in Buddhist studies. You are expert in both fields. What do you see as a Buddhist psychotherapy? And he said, there's no such thing as a Buddhist psychotherapy. There's no Buddhism. There's no psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. When you sit in a room, there's only that person sitting across to you. Your only job is actually to listen to that person and that's it <laughs> so what Dodge said reminded me of what he said and it actually uh like i mean years later i feel more what he said of how sometimes that at least i am clinging on a certain kind of like who i am the concepts and thought that like just like monica said i know more than you i should offer to you but when we let go of them it's just two people connecting it's just a humble listening to another person's suffering. It's just accompanying, being present, like Dolce said. Exactly. This is the most important essence. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to fight with yourself uh, to do that. Um, when Before His Holiness Dalai Lama became a celebrity, I was his student. And uh, I was uh, very young and very Cuban at the time. 
So I was always, you know, blah, 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 talking about it and, you know, doing all the so-called stereotypical Cuban things. And um, and one day I said uh, to His Holiness, I, I think I'm not going to be a Buddhist. And he said, why? He said, um, and I said to him, you know, Buddhists are too quiet. You know, you just don't talk very much. And I feel so lonely here. I mean, I was in Dharamsala for a year. Nobody used to talk and uh, and or hear music or something like that, except, you know, music in the compass and so forth. And he said, well, maybe your task here is how to become Buddhist and keep being a Cuban. <laughs> and I said, sort of like, okay, so that's your task and not talk about it anymore. And so... I've just taken not to talk about it, and I'm not sure if I'm still that Cuban, and I'm sure I'm not sure if I'm that Buddhist. So, <laughs> thank you both so much. We received another question um, in the chat, and I I dropped in a resource from the chat that you're you've already named Dorje as a book by Dwayne Bidwell. It's his other book, the one that's coming out. But the question is, uh, Mark wanted to know, is there a difference in counseling a child um, or possibly even a teenager through advanced cancer and an adult with advanced cancer? And George, I don't know if you've, if you've experienced that or worked with families of children mm -hmm. going through this process and maybe if you want to address that. No, but I, I think George should be first. I I am embarrassed to say I actually started this as a child therapist, but I, I I don't think I did so well. But anyway, I will share my insights. I um I think working with children, either with cancer or not with cancer, one of the things very important for all of us to know is that we cannot rely too much just on talking dialogue or just sitting there listening and assuming that they would tell us things. When I do counseling with children is a lot about play, art, using different mediums for them to express, using different ways to make them feel safe and being interested in the world and don't judge them, like play with them, enjoy the processes. And usually they, I mean, most, some children are very articulate, but most children are that they, they need different mediums to help them express themselves. Cancer, death, uh, feeling scared. Having, um, having questions of like, what will happen? Why am I so painful? Why me? What will happen next? All those kind of things. We can use different toys, different artwork to help them express. So in a way, I think you may say there's a difference working with children, but sometimes adults like us, I mean, a part of us are actually children. <laughs> part of us, we just let our language fool ourselves. We are just dwelling in the, all those kind of mental con conceptualizations and cannot express ourselves freely. So I would say those kind of techniques initially developed for children, some of them is actually very helpful for adults. Let them draw out their fear, play it out, play with them, use sentry toys. I think mm -hmm. that bring a very different dynamic. And, mm -hmm. and I also think no matter how scared we are, how lonely we are when we're able to connect. We can still, in the connection, try a way to feel some fun, feel some peace. And then actually, I mm. think sometimes it can help us see how dukkha is impermanent when we're able to connect, have a little fun, and have a little peace together. I was a faculty member and a therapist in... Um a psychotherapist at the School of Medicine at the University of New Mexico. And there I worked um, with what we would call community family therapy. And we brought in um, teachers. We brought in the family. We were also had individual counseling uh, with the child. And that was very, very effective. And then... Um, I left the University of New Mexico and began teaching more in schools of education. And I thought it would be very, very interesting to bring child therapists to talk to the teachers because they were going to have a lot of kids with cancer. And, uh, and I thought that that was extraordinarily useful. Um, so I think there's a need 
not only to talk in Buddhist chaplaincy about, you know, counseling the student with cancer or, or nothing like that, but working, like you said, with the larger framework where the child lives and plays. And uh, I'm not certified in sand play, but I've used some sand play and I find it very effective. And so I agree with you. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, we are at 7.30, so we've been going for 90 minutes. So thank you to all of our attendees who've stuck around that long. This will be recorded um, and we will post it up on the HGS YouTube channel. So if you want to watch it again, or if you want to send it to a friend of yours, you'll be able to do that. I know we had almost 100 people registered. And oftentimes, if they're anything like me, they might register for things they know they can't attend because they want the email with the recording later. <laughs> I'm guilty of that. Um, so we will be posting it up there and everyone will get a chance to see it. But I want to thank all of you so much. Thank you, Dr. Michon. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dorje Kondro, for all of your beautiful wisdom and your stories. I also want to send a special shout out to a person not on the screen, but very much lurking here in the Zoom, Jonathan <laughs> Kransky, um, who is the coordinator for multi-religious ministry at Harvard Divinity School and works very hard to put these together, as well as our IT staff, Bob and Robbie, who make sure that all of our Zoom needs are always met. So thank you to all of the people who are supporting us in the background and to all of you, our, our attendees who came and contributed your questions, and I hope this has been a wonderful experience for you. May we dedicate the merit to all suffering beings, that all beings may find happiness, that all beings may find safety, that all beings may find health and ease and ultimate liberation. Thank you so much and have a lovely night, everyone. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Nathan. And great meeting you, George. Great to meet you, Dolce. Thank you. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you, you. Thank you so Thank much. You. <laughs> yeah. Sponsor Buddhist Ministry Initiative. Copyright 2023. President and Fellows of Harvard College.